Yo, Reddit fam, let me spill the tea on this crazy day that just went down. So picture this. I'm cruising down the streets of Michigan in my dope ride, rocking these stickers on my car that scream I served and disabled veteran inside. Now, I've had these bad boys since the 80s, man. They're like my little way of flexing on life and showing some pride for doing my bit back in Iraq, even if it cost me a leg. Anyway, I'm chilling at a red light, minding my business, jamming to some 80s tunes, because why not? Then, out of nowhere, this lady in a Toyota SUV starts giving me the stink eye. I'm thinking, what's her deal? She starts doing these weird hand gestures, like she's shooting at me or something. I'm just sitting there trying to figure out if she's got a personal vendetta against my car or what. Light turns green, and I hit the gas. That's when this Karen swerves her tank of a car into mine, smacking me from the back. I'm like, what the hell, lady? I roll down my window, and before I can even speak, she starts laying into me, calling me a killer and a criminal. I'm there trying to tell her, look, lady, I did my time. Lost a leg in the process. Show some respect. But nah, she ain't having any of it. She goes on this tirade about how I shouldn't have made it back alive, and our country doesn't need another killer roaming around. Now, I'm getting heated, like, who the heck does she think she is? I tell her she's nuts, and that's when she goes full Hulk mode. She hops out of her SUV, brandishing a freaking wrench like she's in some action movie. I've got a dash cam rolling, thank the stars, catching all this craziness. I call 911, and the operator probably thinks I'm pranking them with how loud Karen is screaming in the background. I'm just like, yo, I need help on a Sir Street name. This lady's lost her marbles. Cops roll up like the cavalry in about five minutes, just in time to catch Karen going ham on my car. They snatch her up, and I'm sitting there watching, thinking man, what just happened? The evidence is all there, clear as day, on that dash cam. I tell the cops, yeah, I'm pressing charges. This lady needs a reality check. Turns out, Karen's got a history of being a menace. They tell me she's got a rap sheet longer than a CV's receipt. Assault, property damage, you name it. I'm just sitting there like, of course I'd run into this tornado of crazy. Next thing you know, we're at the station, filing reports, and I'm still processing the fact that someone tried to wreck my car because they think I'm some kind of criminal. It's wild, man, the things you gotta deal with. The whole time, Karen's still trying to justify her actions, saying I deserved worse. I'm thinking, lady, you need a therapist, not a wrench. Finally, they cuff her, and as they're dragging her away, she's still shouting like a banshee about how she's the victim here. I'm just shaking my head, like, what planet did she crash? Land from. So, that's the saga of how my chill drive turned into a WWE match with Karen. Got my car a little banged up but the dash cam footage is the golden ticket. Gonna take this to court and make sure she learns a lesson. Morale of the story. Some folks out here need more than just a reality check. They need a whole reality check. They need a whole reality overhaul. Stay safe on them streets. Reddit fan. You never know when Karen's gonna roll up and start swinging a wrench. I was reminded of this moment recently. Given the terror Karen's and Brad's give us, I figured we could use some heartwarming. I worked as a photographer at a major theme park for several years and had just gotten off a long shift, having worked three overtime shifts in a row. As I was too tired to cook and was starving, I decided to stop at the grocery store where my brother worked and treat myself the best chicken salad, a piece of cake, and a diet coat. I had grabbed my items and was heading to check out when I saw, out of the corner of my eye, Bogo for semolina flour. Since I have a pasta machine and my brother had a hankering for lasagna, we make our own pasta. I decided to go grab some. While I'm debating how many packages of semolina to get, I hear a boy, let's call him Jason, call out, Jason, a quiet borderline. I turn to look. I should note that I'm still in my costume, blue shorts, a white button-up blouse, a brown vest, and my camera harness. I look him over, thinking he looks familiar, and say, yes? Jason, don't you remember me? You took a photo of me in my Ravenclaw robes a few days ago? Now, I have photographed hundreds of people on a daily basis to the point that I'd recognize people based on their clothing. He had come dressed as a student from Ravenclaw for his birthday. It's pretty rare, but not unheard of, that people show up wearing things from the other theme park. Me. Oh yeah, now I remember you were celebrating your eighth birthday, right? Jason. Yep. The pictures turned out great. Thank you so much. Me. You're welcome. Say, where are your folks? Jason. Mom sent me here to get a box of cake mix. Me. Well, let's go get it for her then. So we get the box of cake mix and I walk with him to his mom. Penny, Jason's six-year-old sister, Annie, and their one-year-old brother, Tommy. Penny immediately recognizes me and looks me over in surprise. Jason, Mom, it's a quiet borderline. She took our picture a few days ago, remember? Penny, oh, 
Yes, it's a pleasure to see you again. Me. It's good to see you again, too. I didn't know you guys were local. Penny. We just moved to Florida. It's my first time at this particular store. Recognizing the harried look on Mom's face, I decided to be nice. Me. Would you like some help? I know the store like the back of my hand. Penny. That would be great. Thank you. Me. You're welcome. So, we continued getting things on the list, and I kept the kids entertained asking them questions about their favorite books and movies and making recommendations about various places to check out. By the time we finished getting everything on the list, Mom was relaxed and the kids excited about all the local places. We get to the checkout lane, my brother's manager calls me by name. While she was scanning her items, she looked at the manager. Penny, a quiet borderline works so hard. Please make sure she gets a day off with pay. The manager and I look at each other confused before it hits me. Me, I actually don't work here. My brother does, though. We had a good laugh over it, and I politely declined Penny's offer to pay for my groceries. However, Penny offered me a job as a babysitter, to which I said yes. That was maybe five years ago, and we're still friends to this day. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. This might be my last post on here, as the moving date has been set. I'll be moving out next year, and away from this place I used to call home. Finally, Merry Christmas, everyone, and a Happy New Year. I'll start a few weeks ago. My brother recently had his birthday, and he used it as an opportunity to abuse everyone without the fear of consequence. During the 11th of November, Remembrance Day, and during the minute silence, he made as much noise as he could, and I tried to hold myself back after the minute had finished. His birthday week was chaotic. On his actual birthday, he whined about the presents not being in a specific size or quantity. My parents did absolutely nothing after he said this, which disgusted me. Every single day, he tormented me and told me to kize on different days. At the end of the week, we were meant to have a BBK to commemorate his birthday. I was going to attend, but he began to verbally abuse and physically harm me, so I decided to leave and go to my partner's house. Before I left, I learned about why my parents ignored his abuse and blamed me for his actions. They told me that if they didn't see it, then it didn't happen. They didn't want to call him out for his actions, as that would make them all feel bad. And if he told them something didn't happen... Even if they saw it, they would ignore it, as they wouldn't want to call him a liar. According to them, I need counseling. I spent the rest of the day with my partner, which I really enjoyed. I had to come home afterward, and I was instantly berated by my sibling and told to keys again. I wanted to stay with my partner and not come back here. During the weeks up to Christmas, life took a difficult turn, and I tried my hardest to pick myself up again while my family tried to force me back down, with my brother creating drama out of nothing to demean me while my parents took his side. Work got busier and busier, and one of my best friends there unfortunately left. I've also been doing a lot of housework with my family, not even bothering to help, even if I get overwhelmed and nauseated from the speed I'm working at. I found myself getting overworked, and I was asked to work Christmas Eve, and now I've been asked to work New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. I'm currently saving up leave time for an event that'll take place next year in February. I'll get on to what happened during Christmas. I just wanted to enjoy Christmas with my family and spread holiday cheer. I wrapped most of the gifts and decorated the house while everyone didn't even lift a finger to help. I tried very hard to make Christmas Day the best I could, but now I'm wondering why I even tried in the first place. At every moment on Christmas Day, I had my brother trying to start a fight with me. I don't know why. During our Christmas lunch, he stood up and screamed at me to shut up and fawthing die, even though I was just eating. My parents didn't do anything. Every time I've tried to talk today, he's either told me to shut up or he's been speaking over the top of me. He's been trying to exclude me from the family Christmas celebration all day. During the gift opening, he threw a tantrum that I got a Sonic Lego set. He also got a very large present, a picture from Stranger Things, and proceeded to tease me about it since he had a bigger present. He was acting like he was two. We also opened our presents after everything had been handed out, and he hadn't opened the large one yet when I opened the Sonic one. The cherry on top was what happened during the afternoon. I was asked to play a game of Monopoly, and I agreed. It was a tough game, and I found myself getting stressed out from the game and from the heat. I tried to leave, but my mother was close to winning, and for some reason, she didn't want the game to end. I felt frustrated, and when I tried to leave again to have a break, she demanded that I come back and help her pack up. I forfeited the game, and then my brother decided to mock me for losing. I was this, close to punching him. When I helped pack up, she guilt-tripped me about not being able to play Monopoly with her in the future. I wanted to cry. This was all because she wanted to win. The day was awful. During dinner, my brother tried to scare me as much as he could. 
He slammed the fridge, kicked the pantry, and thumped the kitchen bench aggressively. I finished dinner as fast as I could. He also threw a pile of clothes at me. It's not as bad as what's happened for most of the day, but I was still upset nonetheless. The next day, I was subjected to more abuse, but without it being Christmas Day. My mother tried to start something with me just because I took my breakfast out of the pantry, and my brother tried to start something just because I walked past him. This evening, I got called out for dinner and went to the kitchen. My brother was there, and I kept my distance from him. I breathe softly at a quick pace when I'm afraid, and that's how I show my fear. He knows this, and he's exploited me for it repeatedly. He teasingly told me to breathe, and after he sat down at the table, he ranted at me for discriminating against him. This got my parents into another discussion, where they blamed me again for everything that goes on in this household. I remembered about needing to check something, and I walked back to my room. They began to yell at me for walking away and told me I was immature. I tried to explain that I was checking something to them, but my mom screamed at me and said, I'm not a mind reader. And I'm not your bi... When I walked back into the kitchen, I took my dinner to another room, wanting to avoid the conversation. After I finished my dinner and came back out, I placed my plate neatly in the dishwasher. For some reason, this caused my mother to flip out again, and she yelled at me for slamming things into the dishwasher when I wasn't even doing that. I walked away to my room, which is where I am now. She barged into my room and yelled at me to grow up, and that I was acting like I was two, and that I apparently thought the whole world revolved around me. She then brought up the Monopoly game and forgot to mention that she wanted to keep playing even though I was getting stressed. She called me pathetics and did the whole, oh, I'm losing, wahamitation. I wanted to bring up what she did, but I knew that'd just make her angrier. My dad agreed with her as well, and my brother yelled out his agreement from the table. I shut my door again and cried, with my brother mocking me from outside my bedroom door. I know the moving date is coming up next year, but I'm wondering if I should run away. I don't know how much more of this I can take. On Saturday night, I was supposed to go to dinner with some folks from work, including a girl who said she needed a ride. Her car isn't the most reliable, so I said I'd give her a life. She's about 10 years younger than me, the shortest girl at the office, and very, very Hispanic. I say this not as a put-down, but it's essential in the context of the story. You'll see. I set off a few minutes early to the address I'd been given, and wound up pulling up to a home with signs outside that said, Smile, you're on camera, asshole, and grinned. I liked the attitude those signs displayed. I just really hoped I was in the right place. Texted the girl from work that I was ready for extract, and she said she'd be right there. So I got out of my car, did a bit of AI just drove for a while stretch, and then leaned against my car and started going through my phone. While I was waiting and minding my own business, I sensed someone approaching. What gave it away was someone saying, I think you came to the wrong neighborhood and two other dudes chuckling at the line as they approached. They looked to be about my age or maybe a bit younger, mid-twenties to early thirties. I didn't see any tattoos, but we were all about the same size and they had three to my one. Those were not the kind of odds you want to see. I started doing that thing people do when they're about to panic and they're trying to calm the situation down, waving my hands up and down and saying something along the lines of, hey man, I'm just doing my thing. I'm just doing my thing. I work with the girl that lives in that house and she asked me to give her a ride. I turned to point at the house in question and was greeted with the sight of an older man holding a baseball bat leaving the house and also approaching myself and my new friends, smacking his palm with the bat and chuckling in a menacing fashion as he came. While I was busy staring at the man with the baseball bat, all three of the other dudes started to invade my personal space. The older guy with the bat comes up to us and, still smacking his palm with the bat, in a tone that promises violence is imminent, says, you should get in your car and go on home before something bad happens. At that moment, when I was torn between, I said I'd do a thing, so I'm going to do the thing, and oh, 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 my saving grace approached. Rapidly, a gray sedan was driving up the street and upon seeing me surrounded by other people, absolutely gunned it and squealed into the driveway of the house. I had parked in the street because I know what I'll be right. They're mean and didn't want to be in anyone's way. Out of the car flew the girl I was supposed to be giving a ride to. She was pissed. Immediately starts speaking Spanish rapidly, and in a furious tone, I swear her temper added a good foot in height while she read all four of the dudes who got in my face the riot act. She actually started shaking a finger under the noses of the first bunch of dudes who all made sorry noises in Spanish and slunk off towards wherever they came from with their metaphorical tails between their legs. I don't speak Spanish, but I do know a come to Jesus when I hear one. 
and then our heroine turns on the man with the bat, who has since hidden the bat behind his back like it's going to save him. While all this is happening, the other occupant of the car has gotten out. It's our heroine's grandmother. She's moseying her way down the driveway, completely bypasses the girl from work, and the man with the bat and comes right up to me and says, in the cutest Abuela accent, Oh, you're the nice man who fixes it when a granddaughter's name is about to cry from the computer. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you very much for driving her to dinner. Please try and make sure she doesn't get into any trouble. I made your very welcome noises and then said, you know, I don't think a granddaughter's name needs much looking after. Nor do I think I want to be the one to tell her she can't do something she wants to. Seems unsafe. I finished in an amusing tone, while the man with the bat, who was indeed my co-worker's father, continues getting scolded. Then the sweet old lady laughs at my joke, and then her tone shifts, and she barks something in Spanish in a tone reserved for little boys who have gotten a case of the clevers, and then points at me, points at co-worker, and then growls something else. Absolutely no idea what was said, but Batman is now looking at the ground. He walks over and takes the nice woman's elbow and leads her up the stairs and into the house. I'm still stood there trying to figure out what in the world just happened to me. I think the slack jaw gave it away and my co-worker just says my dad thought you were my boyfriend and called some neighbors. Sorry. You ready to go? This will be decently long as it needs some context. I'm going to throw in a lot of stuff to make it all easier to understand as well. I'll put a star sign where the story proper starts, in case anyone wants to skip the preamble. Minor details might not be entirely accurate, as I've no interest in a revival of this conflict on any level. I won completely, and any resurrection can only taint the experience. We'll start off by noting that I spent about two decades working in security. During that time, I worked many different types of security in many different locations. The one that matters for this story was time spent in the rental housing tribunal in a major city as a kind of bailiff. For those not knowing what that is, think a courtroom in a major city anyway. In a smaller town, it'll probably be an event room in a hotel or community center as you'd see on TV, but with less formality and an adjudicator instead of a judge. They functionally are the same thing to landlords and tenants, but they definitely aren't the same thing. This place exclusively deals with landlord and tenant disputes and is the only place to resolve landlord and tenant disputes. Note that I wasn't a bailiff and it wasn't a court, but these terms mostly accurately describe the situation and my place in it. For two years, I worked at the Rental Housing Tribunal. It was early in my time in security. I was 18, 20-ish. Being as it was a major city, the sheer number of cases I sat through was beyond my ability to count. I saw everything there was to see. None is capable of surprising me with a story because I've seen them all. In detail, as a side duty of mine was to ensure all parties had copies of all evidence being presented, I did a lot of photocopying, and always read inspected everything I copied to ensure nothing got cut off or made illegible. By the time I stopped working there, I probably knew the way everything worked well enough to be an adjudicator myself. Well, no, obviously not. But I'm certainly in no need of a lawyer, either should I ever have need to go there. I also had intimate knowledge of how the system worked beyond the actual rules. Like, for example, adjudicators would always give a little leeway to anyone representing themselves over someone who had a lawyer. Or how pissed off adjudicators would get when a party was speaking out of turn. Seriously, do not do that. Skip forward almost a decade. I left the city and I'm in a fairly large town in the same province, same tenant laws. I have a few roommates in a decently sized townhouse. We get along well, but there's a problem. Only I can write checks and our paydays don't line up. So I'm the one who pays the rent and I usually can't do it on the first because roommates don't usually all pay in time. We advise the landlord we might be a day or two late, but we'll always have it by the third at the latest. They have no problem with it at all. I spoke to them myself. For about a year, this works fine. No complaints from landlord because even if we're often a day or two late, we always pay. We're also fairly quiet and don't damage the property. Nearly model tenants. I do not actually have any idea why, but one day this changed. I suspect a different person in the company started overseeing the region. One day, suddenly we got a summons to the rental housing tribunal, hereafter to be referred to as Red HT, on the second of the month for failure to pay rent. This doesn't actually lead to a case because we paid the same day. But now we have to pay the application fee the landlord paid in order to serve the summons. I bitched to the neighbor who was also the superintendent and eventually heard back that their contact at the company was now demanding first of the month no exception. Well, that really didn't work for us, so we probably had to pay that fee 15, 20 times over the next two years. 
I could have gone to tribunal over it, but we were technically without a leg to stand on, and I knew it. Maybe if I went enough times, I can ding them for harassment, but I, I don't have time for that, and my roommates don't care. After being split between us all, the fee wasn't enough deterrent to change our behavior, so we accepted it. If this was the only issue, there wouldn't be much story, though. At around the same time, the rent leeway vanished. So did mandatory maintenance. You'll get a decent idea at the end. We suffered through it. We were all working too many hours at pay to be able to actually do anything about it. We adapted. But after about two years, it broke. Everyone but me up and moved out for various reasons within a four-month period. I'm not going into any details on my roommates at all because things kind of exploded for a couple different reasons outside of this. No reason to dig any of that up. I'd been saving up a while and was able to quit my job without having to immediately get another, so I suddenly had a lot of time. I didn't want to stay and pay the rent by myself or have to find new roommates I could live with, and with my experience in the right, I knew I had the landlord by the balls. So I went for them. I stopped paying rent. Annoyingly, I didn't get a summons the first month, but I did the second, so I went. With a meticulously documented plethora of evidence of failure to maintain the property and entering the property without formal notice, I had a copy for the landlord and a copy for the adjudicator. I know from experience that technically you're supposed to give the other party the evidence before the tribunal, but I also knew about that leeway an adjudicator gives to those who represent themselves. So I didn't give the landlord the evidence until our case came up 100 total ambush. They argued they were ambushed, but the adjudicator just dismissed the case, dressed me down a little, and told me to file my own summons as I should have done. This was the petty revenge. The landlord and lawyer drove three hours to get there for nothing. Worse than nothing. I filed my own summons, and the big day shows up. It's been about four months of me not paying rent at this point. I'm prepared to if I lose, but I don't think I'm going to lose. The whole thing could not have gone better. I had 20, 30 pages of evidence and 20-odd photographs. They had nothing. They had no actual defense for our water heater being out for six months or us not having a fridge for a year, just to mention two several issues. Their entire defense rested on us being late for rent, which actually worked against them once that led to the adjudicator learning how many times we'd paid the application fee, and lies that had no evidence to support them. They even talked over me a few times, and I saw in his eyes the one time. I opened my mouth to protest during their turn to speak, but forced myself to shut up with every gram of willpower I had, so only a squeak came out. The adjudicator respected me. He had no respect for the landlord. I had won on every possible front. The only question was how much. It was more than I had ever seen. I got nine months of free rent, and the landlord was ordered to have everything fixed before the next month was over, or I'd get more. I gave notice I was leaving at the end of the eighth month and left at the end of the ninth. Because the landlord had never renewed the lease, I didn't have to give him the three-month notice the lease specified. If you want a figure to put to it, I basically got a $13,000 judgment in my favor, adjusted for inflation and rounded. I also made the landlord and lawyer drive three hours twice, only to lose. The landlord's face was so red at the end, I thought he'd have a heart attack. He didn't, though. By Mark. Edit to clarify a few things based on questions. I also want to add for those good landlords out there, I do feel you. My time in the right was eye-opening. For every bad landlord, there are ten bad tenants easily. There is a massive debate of debates to have over the whole thing. I'll only say that I do sympathize with the good landlords out there. I'm not trying to paint all landlords as terrible. This is the only landlord I've ever had that was so useless. Edit, edit. I've revised my estimate of the ratio based on a little research and some comments from 30 tenants per landlord to 10. I'm probably still wrong, but the sheer number disparity between landlords and tenants effectively requires there be more bad tenants than bad landlords simply because there are so many more tenants than landlords. I'm going to leave it at that and just beg you not to rip me apart from either side. I'm intimately aware of the problems both good landlords and good tenants face, and my sympathy goes out to both sides. I don't know if this counts as entitled parents, but I also don't know where else to post this. Feel free to lump if it doesn't belong. I'm a 31F, and when I was 19, I realized I was queer. Neither of my parents took it well. When I told my mom, she very bluntly said, so what? So what is I grew up in a very homophobic home, and this was a big step for me? A few years later, I was outed to my dad, and he told me that while he loved me, he'd never accept that part of me, and if I married a woman, he wouldn't come to the wedding. They've since made steps to get better, but it's like going from a 20 grade to a 40 grade to a 40 grade. That's a lot of progress, but it's still a failing grade. To give you a further idea, 
Anytime I ask my mom not to say something homophobic, she goes, well, you know, Ope, some of your father and my closest friends are gay and I don't appreciate you attacking me. To which I say, mom, you did not just use the I have gay friends argument, did you? All this while, they both told me for years to never come out to my grandma. She's from a different time. It'll destroy your relationship with her. She'll gossip to the whole family and you'll be ostracized. And for the most part, I was inclined to agree with them. I don't know much about my grandma's politics. She's very private about it. But based on the news she watches and what my dad believes, I can guess it's pretty far from my beliefs. I'm extremely close with her, though. And so the thought of underlying bigotry coming out and spoiling our relationship was terrifying to me. However, for the rest of the family, I honestly don't talk to most of them, so I couldn't care less what they say or think of me. But after years of this, it got so exhausting. I've been gradually shifting to be more masculine. I was a pretty tomboyish kid until I felt pressured to lean towards femininity, so it feels like I'm being more of myself. I've cut my hair and started wearing men's clothes. And after I did, my grandma started making comments of how I used to have such long, pretty hair and gorgeous dresses. This was on top of my parents immediately assuming I was trans when I cut my hair and my mom, telling me her greatest fear was the possibility of me telling her I felt like a boy. So it kind of cut deep. Over a decade of this wore me down further and further until the facade was paper thin, and it was just a don't ask, don't tell situation. And all this time my parents keep reminding me, you can never tell grandma. Well, finally it got to be enough. I couldn't take the thought of it anymore. After long conversations with my siblings and therapists and friends, I decided to write a letter explaining how I felt. I work very hard to keep it kind, to give the benefit of the doubt, because I am close to her and I love her. And I love her, and even though I highly doubted it would work out, I figured I should at least open the door. A few days after I sent it, she called to tell me she'd read it. I was silent for a few moments before she said, Op, love is not conditional. You can tell me anything in the world and I'll always love you, no matter what. This changes nothing. I was absolutely stunned. For years I was convinced that doing this would destroy our relationship, that being honest would only bring pain. I believed my parents when they told me she couldn't possibly understand, but then she turned around and gave me what they never did. Typing it out right now has me tearing up, and I remember crying over the phone with her as she continued to assure me how much she loved me. I also asked if she could keep it between us, to which she exclaimed, of course, this is no one else's business. Our relationship has been stronger than ever since then. But behind all that are the entitled parents. I'd mentioned to Grandma that my parents told me she wouldn't understand and that shocked her and hurt her feelings. And the more I go back and think about everything they said to me about it, the more I realize that they were just projecting their own failings onto Grandma to make themselves look better by comparison. They're from a time where they could have known better, and they didn't. They said being honest with Grandma would affect our relationship because it has with mine and my parents. They said she'd gossip and it ostracized me when really they were worried about being gossiped about themselves, being the family with the gay kid having to answer questions and, God forbid, stand up for me. But more than that, I know they gossip about me too. One of my siblings told me they had to shut them down because they said, I just don't get why she keeps getting so upset about this gay thing. Why can't she just keep it to herself? As if saying anything more than a sevdu joke doesn't make the blue screen of death pass over my dad's eyes for ten minutes. I haven't told them I came out to her. It's been a few months now. And I'm still considering how I want to approach it. But not only did they spend the last 12 years disparaging my grandmother, they denied me the love she could have given me in that time. The love I should have received from them. I don't know if it will solve anything to confront them about it, but it infuriates me every time I think about it. This is also only one, unfortunate, aspect about much more complicated people. I love my parents. They're not as bad as you might think from just these descriptions. They have many good qualities and spread a lot of good to the people around them. I want to keep them in my life. Human beings aren't black and white. Yeah, no, we're all shades of gray. It's just that sometimes you've got to vent about the shitty parts. This is probably a mundane post, but I had to get this off my chest. Today I was waiting in line at my pharmacy and an elderly woman asked if she could go ahead of me. If it were just me in the line, I probably would have said yes. But there were other people lined up, so I told her you can go ahead of me, but you have to ask the others in line as well. This Karen blew up at me. I don't know exactly what she said because I was focusing on myself and my meds, but she started screaming at me. I turned to her and said, you are harassing me. Do we need to get the police involved? I know the language is stilted, but in my line of work, I am trained to be direct about that sort of thing. She had the nerve to say that she wasn't harassing me at all and that she would gladly call the police because I didn't give her my place in line. I said, okay, sure. 
Call them. I actively encourage you to do so. In fact, I will wait here after I get my medical to ensure the police get the story straight. Karen calls the police. They show up because, well, they have to. Karen gets a lecture from a very large man about the context of when she should call the police. She's informed that me not letting her budge in line and what she calls bad customer service is not a reason to involve the police. The pharmacist is on his third cup of coffee since this all started. I know he's an innocent victim in all this and that if I let Karen ahead of me, his problems might not exist. The officer removes Karen, who is audibly angry and asking the officer how she can get her meds if she's banned from the store. It, Corinne. Have them transferred to a different pharmacy and behave like an actual human being there? 